I was delighted to come. I was delighted to have an opportunity to comment on Will's paper, which is fantastic. Um, it's a wonderful idea. Just the insight to help us think about severability in terms of conflict of law principles to say that this isn't just a matter of congressional intent and, and weird statutory interpretation. No, it's a matter of constitution ruling over certain provisions and only those provisions. Um, and I think it might be able to. It might be seen as a limitation on the federal judicial power. Although I'm going to ask you about that. Um, so I think Will does a wonderful job coming up with this idea. It gives formalists a reason to accept severability doctrine um, in a very intuitive way. Um, and he also grapples with a lot of the issues um, underlying severability doctrine. So lots and lots of good stuff here. Um, so I do have a number of comments and questions that I hope will be helpful as, as you revise the paper. Um, the first thing, and I think you were alluding to this at the end, uh, Will comes up with a really wonderful idea for us to understand the principle of severability, but has, a, has more trouble with kind of the so what question, right? Like what do we do with it when we actually have these conflicting provisions? Um, and, I th and that's what you were alluding to at the end, it's, it's hard. And I was a little surprised that the paper kind of falls back on statutory interpretation. After getting us out of the statutory interpretation muddle, we're sort of taken back into it. And that's particularly true with what Will was talking, talking about at the very end of his comments in saying, so we've got, these, we've got this combination problem where two provisions are unconstitutional together, but either one of them could be perfectly okay by itself. So what do you do? Um, and Will offers various ideas, says textualists are gonna have trouble with this. Maybe you just kind of fall back on congressional intent, but then we feel like we're back at the place that you were rescuing us from in the beginning. And so what I th was expecting you to say, um, given that you're a departmentalist um, and that you're not afraid to take a, an, an idea to its logical conclusion, <laughs> I, I expect you to say, say, okay, the federal court in these combination cases has to say, look, our power is to declare that this statute in combination, these two provisions in combination, are unconstitutional. And that's all we can do. And so political branches, it is now your job to figure out which one you want to apply, the application of which can be challenged in a future case, but it's up, the, up to the political branches rather than the courts to figure out which one to excise. Um, so that's what I thought you would say. Um, that's not what you say. So, I found that interesting, and I'm a little curious why. Now, I want to be clear, like, the, what I'm suggesting is my, my assumed will response is not the most administrable system, right? Like, which may be why you didn't pick it. Uh, but, but I can see that being kind of the implication of these principles, and also very consistent with your vision of judicial review as something that happens in the context of a case or controversy, and not something where judges get to declare stuff for the future. So um, you can decide whether you want to to do what I suggested. Now, if you don't do that, then, then there's, there's the payoff problem. Like, what, what do we get out of this if we're kind of back in the statutory interpretation muddle? Um, and one of the things I, I would like to see you do in the future is, is point out that even if, you, even if you go there and say this is just a statutory interpretation question at the end of the day, at least in hard cases, I think there is tremendous payoff of this paper. And I think you actually, it's, it's there in the paper, but I think you bury it more than, more than you should. So um, there are several things that I really, I really want you to kind of put together as the implications um, that are buried in various, or just stated in various parts. The first implication is that the presumption of severability should almost never be rebutted. Um, and I think that's an extraordinarily important implication for both doctrine and legal practice. Um, and I think that follows very, very nicely from your conflict of law arguments that you, and following from that, Facial challenges are also gonna be really, really hard. I was a little surprised you didn't you didn't say we were gonna dis dispense with them entirely. Um, Will has a really interesting argument in the paper that well, maybe for some constitutional provisions like the First Amendment, they just require facial invalidation, which is a really interesting idea, plausible. Um, but I think you could come out much more strongly that facial invalidation is extremely difficult on your vision of severability. And um, I think you can also come out a little bit stronger on nat national injunctions than you do. Um, and point out, these are really, really important payoffs of the paper, even if you haven't figured out the hard cases and statutory interpretation. So I also think um, you have a really, really powerful point about standing and severability. I am not 
yet convinced um, that it's not a standing problem and it's a severability problem. But whether one is convinced or not, I think playing that up as an extraordinarily important part of the paper is, is, is very powerful. And I would actually put your two discussions of Texas versus the United States together rather than, rather than have them separate. So I think even if you don't go to sort of the extreme argument that I was suggesting I expect you to expect you to make. Um, I think the paper still has tremendous payoff. And one thing, you could, one thing you could do in this paper is say you haven't totally figured out the statutory interpretation stuff, and point out there's still there's still tremendous um, tremendous payoff. Okay, just a few more comments. I found myself wondering what is the legal source of the principles you're talking about. And you 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 pointed out that they may not be they may not be entirely originalist principles. I couldn't tell if you viewed this as a limitation on the scope of the Article III judicial power, perhaps in, as an original matter, um, or as principles of general law. But I figured it was one or the other. Um, and it may not actually matter, but I think it's really interesting to think about which of these two things are you, are you saying. Um, and if it's the Article III judicial power, um, is it just for federal courts, or does, is it actually part of the judicial power as a whole that could apply to various various types of courts? Um, so, just something to think about as you're as you're conceptualizing this. Now, a smaller critique. So, Will does this um, offers us this 60 years of case law history in, in a remarkably short, like four pages, um, and it's it's very interesting to show that um, early courts did something similar to what Will is advocating. You take the constitutional provision, you just strike, you just get rid of this one part of the law. Uh, but I did find myself wondering as a methodological matter, uh, and this may be why you don't call it an originalist paper, what that tells us, if it is supposed to tell us something about the Article III judicial power that for 60 years courts did something like what you want. Uh, maybe it does tell us something, but I found myself wondering that. And for me, there was a, there was a bit of an omission in Dred Scott. So you did 60 years, um, and it was convenient, because then that's before <laughs> Dred Scott. Uh, but given that that's kind of a glaring Supreme Court invalidation of federal law, and, and a pretty big one and broad one too, I, I thought it would be helpful to at least um, tell folks how, if, if it's true, Dred Scott is consistent with or at odds with what you are advocating. Uh, as you can tell from the amount of time I spend on them, I'm more interested in the problems that I don't have good answers to than the ones I do. Uh, which is why I gloss over and bury all the things that uh, Tara likes, but I agree that's not a good service and we'll work on that. Uh, so I'll just skip those and answer just the hard questions. I, I think it's worse, I think the will solution that Tara proposes to begin with uh, won't work. The idea of judges just saying, well, all we can do is declare the constitutional conflict and leave it to the other branches. Because courts don't actually even have a power just to declare constitutional conflicts. They get that power only derived from their power to decide whether to grant relief or not to the party before them. And so the problem is that frequently an unconstitutional combination makes it unclear whether or not the judges should grant relief to the party before them. When uh, the challengers in Collins versus Yellen say, we wanna have the Third Amendment to the uh, whole thing thrown out because the agency lacked valid enforcement power. And the response is, no, no, their enforcement power, power is valid. It's just the possibility of them being removed that was invalid. The, which one the court decides is the one that's valid and which one the court decides has to be disregarded affects whether or not the relief is throw out the entire enforcement action or try to figure out whether that removal provision had any effect. Same thing in Shelby County. If the constitutional accommodation arises from the combination of the preclearance regime and the overly stringent bailout uh, requirements, which one of those is, is unenforceable will affect whether the relief is uh, you know, the regime can't, the pre-clearance pre -clearance regime can't be enforced or uh, the agency has to go seek bailout. So the court can't even like decide the case, decide whether to grant relief or not, which is a prerequisite. Now maybe we could have a sort of uh, a, a burden of proof that just says you can't win unless you can show that you should win. And since we don't know which of the two provisions is right, you lose on some kind of like preponderance of the evidence standard. Uh, that would be a little neat. Uh, work differently in criminal cases, so I'd have to think about whether I can, whether I can squeeze one out of that. Um, two other quick things. Uh, legal source. I think, I, I, I think the right way to think about this is these are constitutional law and statutory and, and statutory slash general law rules together about what the law is. Severability is a question of what the law is. It's not a rule for judicial power. However, judicial power tells judges to follow the law. Article two also tells the executive to follow the law. So the severability principles work out pretty much the same for both judges 
and everybody in Article 2, because both of them have a duty to follow the law, and severability is a question of what the law is. I think that's the, right, the, way, to, the way to work it out. Dred Scott's a fair challenge, and I will actually tell you the omission is not strategic. I just tried to stop before the first inseverability cases started to kind of look at the, at the ancien regime. The, the court is doing so many strange things in Dred Scott, just, you know, including so the question of like jurisdiction and dictum and whether they should be granting relief at all, that how to even think about the severability problem in Dred Scott is really making my head hurt, but it would be kind of fun to try to figure it out. So I accept the challenge. <laughs>